filled with the presence of God as you watch Jesse and Kathy's anointed messages of faith. Receive free instant access to these powerful teachings today by downloading the JDM app. You will be able to stream hundreds of sermons on your smart TV, your web browser, and any mobile device. You will also have access to our weekly TV show and much more. Download the JDM app today. Available on Google Play, the Apple Store, Roku TV, and more. Did you know that doubt is a habit? Yes, it is. You aren't born a doubter. You learn to doubt over time. In my book, I Never Learned to Doubt, you will learn something. And what is that? To go back in time and regain what was lost so that you can enjoy more peace, more joy, more favor, and more blessing. The wonder of faith is a pure thing. It's a childlike thing. And faith is the only thing that God responds to. When you never learn to doubt, life is so much better. I Never Learned to Doubt. It's my new book. Get it today. A vision always starts with a dream. Do you see yours? Break free from the boundaries of natural thinking and ignite your vision. Your vision isn't where you are, it's where you're going. Faith and divine direction can bring it to completion. Your vision is calling you. Make your vision a living reality. Jesse Duplantis' 2021 Visionary Conference, July 15th and 16th. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this very special event. Power, he has raised. 
he saved our souls with his power he has raised us up to God be the glory for the things he has Lord, we invite you in this place. We thank you for this night. Thank you, God, we worship you. We worship you.
atmosphere It manifest your presence Lord We invite you here Each one of us Lord We just want to hear God We invite you here Holy Spirit change this atmosphere your hands to the Lord. God, we love you. Let us taste of the heavenlies tonight. Your will be done. Your kingdom come in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just give him praise right now. Yes, Lord. You may be seated if you can. Thank you for coming tonight and being a part of this. To you that are watching all over the world, we thank you for tuning in. Faith destroys all distance between me and you, and God is just that fast to get whatever you believe in for, spiritually, physically, financially, in any area of your life, God will do that. And I tell you, it's such an honor and a pleasure for all of you to come. I like all my spiritual sons and daughters. Uh, and their families, if you'll stand to your feet, please. I'd like the people give them a hand clap. These are people that are my sons and daughters. Thank you. What a blessing of the Lord. You might be seated. I had them all when I was 12. <laughs> and God has been so good and gracious. I want to thank all the people from flying in. We have Pastor George and Terry Pearson from Eagle Mountain International Church. Lift your hands like this and give them a nice hand. We got something better. We have the grand girl, the grandchildren. I want the two grandgirls to stand up. Give them a hand clap. And Miss Aubrey, you do too. Aubrey, stand up. Come on. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Thank you. Children love what I'm about ready to start talking about. In fact, my daughter Jody said, Dad, you need to take that book and childrenize it. I don't know if that's the right word or not. And make it a children's book, and we could do that. And because so many children ask me about that all the time, every time I see them. But God has been so good and gracious, so I thank each and every one of you. I want to get into this thing. I ask that so I can have the amount of time that I feel the Lord wants me to have. And let me just say this. This is not me. I would not do this. I'm a man that uh, I have kept this very private. Uh, I've only done this three different times, one in 1988 when it happened, and then about, oh, five, six years later when we did the book, um, John Osteen asked if I would come and he had just built his new facility, and it was about 8,100 people, and it was standing, standing up. They didn't have a seat left, you know. And, uh, and then about 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, Keith Moore asked me to say a few words about it, and I did. And the reason why, because it's very, very personal to me, uh, this, that this wonderful, it's not a vision, it's a trip. And I'll explain that. I mean, nothing wrong with a vision, don't misunderstand me. But I mean, I'm physical, I got sucked out the room. Now, I, and, uh, and I, I wrote a book called Close Encounters of the God Kind. I'm going to say a couple of close encounters before I get into the heaven thing to make you understand where God was leading me at that time. So I was 39 years old uh, when this happened in 1988 in Magnolia, Arkansas, at the Magnolia Christian Center. I was preaching a revival there. In those days, you did a Sunday through Wednesday meeting. You know, Sunday, if y'all remember that, if you uh, way back when. And, uh, and now, I can prove all the other close encounters physically. I can't prove this because you're just going to have to believe it, but I don't want you to believe it because you like me. I want you to believe it because it touches your spirit. Check the Holy Ghost that's inside of you. Because St. John 16, verse 13 said, How be it when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all truth. 
and not some truth, but all truth. So I, I want you to check this in your spirit, and I, I'm going to let God just do what he wants with me. Now, if you have the book and the different things, I may go a little different because I've learned something that when I spoke about it. In a book, you can just write it all down and do different things. There were some things I was not allowed to reveal. Some I'm going to reveal tonight in some areas but because that was what the Lord said to do. But it depends who comes, how God ministers to that individual. So he'll make me stay more on a, on a particular subject because it's meant to someone. That's just how that works. So in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, Isaiah was saying, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That's a prophetic word because in those days, nothing could come out the holies of holies. You couldn't see that was all closed off. You would die. And yet God was speaking a future thing that his train would come out of the holies of holies into the holy place, into the whole complete temple. What he was talking about was this New Testament church that we have today, that he was able to express his, his presence without you dying of it. God began to reveal himself to different people. He revealed himself to Adam and he breathed into his nostrils he did not breathe in his mouth. That's CPR. He breathed into his nostrils and he became a, a, he breathed lives, which means me and you were in that. If you go to the book of Genesis, you'll find that. Lives, not just a life, lives. Things were being set up. Many, many men, Jacob had a, a phenomenal encounter with God and then realized what was going on. And many, many people God showed himself to, those that wanted to be. And there are a lot of people want, but sometimes they have a, a second agenda. The reason why I haven't talked about it because I never wanted to exploit this thing. It was so precious and, and good to me. I didn't, you know, and yet I had two Hollywood directors and two Hollywood producers offer me millions of dollars to do a film on it. I mean, millions. Just upfront money plus percentages of whatever the, the movie would do, and I turned it down because they wanted total rights because I would not allow anything untruthful in that. I just tell you what happened, and I believe that. I, I, I'm not, I don't add anything. So, um, and I, so I, I, I'm very serious about that because it's very precious. Then if you go over to the Revelations, you'll find out that John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. See, now to understand these things, you have to be in the Spirit. Your Spirit housed in a soul and clothed in a body. And it comes from your Spirit through a renewed mind, through a soul, through a crucified body. And when you understand that, then you begin to think like, talk like, smell like, be like God. The Bible says, be you therefore imitators of God as dear children. So I'm going to ask a question right now. How many of you would love to have experience like that? Hold your hand up. Good. Well, if you'll pray and believe God, he'll come to you just as much as he come to me. I mean, he's no respect of persons. So I want to start off right now. And my actually very first encounter, I was such a heathen boy. I didn't yet know this until about two days before my mother died. That she said, I want to tell you something. Uh, it was my brother, me, Wayne, and my oldest brother, and my, my youngest brother, Mark. And the Lord, he, uh, uh, God, Mama wanted a preacher in the family. And the Lord said, okay, go in where the boys are. And she, he said, Jesse will be my preacher. She said, oh, oh no, Jesus. Jesse can't be your <laughs> Jesse's a gangster. He, he don't want that. I mean, we don't know what he's doing right now. We have no idea. He's got scams going all on, all kinds of stuff. But yet the Lord said, put your hand on it. Now, I didn't know that until about two days before she died, that she commissioned me through Christ at that prayer. Because you see, the promises of God are far more powerful than the sins of people. And Kathy says that when I got born again, the father had to give Jesus a blood transfusion because he was running out of blood to wash my sin away. <laughs> I was a chief of sinners. But my first encounter, real quick, I'm going to give you a couple of these, then we'll go into the heaven thing. I was nine years old. I was never afraid of nothing. Not big enough to do anything. Just never was afraid of anything. And I went to bed one night, and uh, I wasn't afraid of the dark, wasn't afraid of anything, you know, just whatever. And because you wasn't allowed to be afraid. Wasn't allowed to cry. I never did cry because we, that, that's not manly to cry. So we learned to suppress and things of that nature. And, um, 
Anyway, to make a long story short, I, I saw a dream with a man, and I saw his face going across, and it was thundering and lightning going crazy in there. And I looked up, and I, and I saw that, and I heard this voice say, Fear God, boy. Fear God, boy. Just that loud. Fear God. And it, it scared me. For the first time, I went, oh, and I ran in there, and I told my mom, I said, Mom, I said, I saw this thing. I was about nine years old. Fear God. She said, you don't fear nothing. That's God talking to you. And I thought, oh, she's she going crazy. But somebody had just said that to me. And that changed me right there. From that point on, God would bother me. <laughs> That's the best word. When I was a nightclub entertainer with the long hair, I mean, he would bother me. I mean, I could hear his voice. And I'd say, and I thought it was, oh, mama is talking about all that religiosity stuff. That's just coming up my brain. And I said, leave me alone. And what I was doing, I was talking to myself, just get that junk out your mind because I thought it was mom, you know, and all that stuff she'd say. But it was the Lord doing those things. So when I came to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and how God did it, how it really shook me up the first time I was ever touched by an angel. I was 17 years old physically. And I borrowed Doris Roberts' car. And uh, uh, there was a kind of a halfway girlfriend. I had a bunch of girlfriends, you know, that kind of stuff. I can't say too much about that because some of them are still living. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I was driving her car going home. It was a very terrible storm going on. And it was a two-lane highway. And I decided that I would um, pass this car. And it was, a, I don't know if you know the car, a Carver. Remember a Carver? Not a Carvette, but a Carver. It was a pretty little car, and as I was going, so I got up to about 65, 70 miles an hour on a two-lane, and as I passed it, the guy that I tried to pass sped up with me. And I had kind of taken a chance to go out, and all of a sudden there's a car coming at me. And I looked at him, and man, I, and he was just smiling. And man, I got closer and closer, and I knew it was gonna be a head-on collision. And I panicked. I hit the brakes. When I hit the brakes, I didn't see him no more. The car slid turned this like this and then did this way then turned around on the road and it hit a, a, a big jar like a, a for drainage what do you call them things and when I did I, the car began to flip and it flipped three times in over in the car began to break up flipping three times in over in and I was I mean I was it was the most amazing thing. in fact the next day it said impossible to live uh, and I landed upside down. I jumped the six-foot mailbox, flipping it. And, and that's when it came, and the doors began to crush. The car began to crush this way, and the doors began to break. And I have to do this, John. I'll use you as a, uh, an example. I mean, I was about ready to be thrown over to the other side, and I felt this much pressure. I felt this much pressure, Kevin. And when I did, the, the door split and a piece of steel about that long come off the door came to right here and stopped i mean it just and i'm flipping and i flip one more time and the steering wheel broke in my hand and then popcorn come flying out the steering wheel i said popcorn look at this <laughs> now the night before, before mama had told me she said i had a dream and I saw you, and the blood of Jesus was covering you. I said, Mommy, you done lost your ever love in mine. You got to get away from them Pentecostals and them Baptists and go back to the Catholic Church. <laughs> now, I don't mean that to be critical. I just, you know, I said, said Mommy, you're just getting crazy. Now, watch this. I mean, and I was upside down, and it was holding me. Okay? Now, the thing that really struck me. And I, I could, but I was upside down. Now, CJ, this shoulder was completely free. Now, I'm going to do you as I did them. But I didn't see the angel. I just felt this much power. Then all of a sudden, it came off me. And I looked and I went, oh, no, what is this? But I couldn't talk because I'm upside down. And of course, it's, I mean, they call it ambulances and everything. And what they call those, uh, where they break the car, those tongs. Uh, this, what, them life things and when they broke it open if it had caught a fire it's a miracle of God didn't catch a fire to burn it down uh, I just fell I fell from you know just into the mud and they throwed me into that crazy ambulance and I almost died because that man was driving like crazy I said you're going to kill us all if you don't slow this thing down you know 
He said, you almost did anyway. So what are you worried about? You know, that kind of stuff. The guy was checking my blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. They gave me three aspirin at the hospital. They said, how you doing? I said, popcorn came out the steering wheel. You know what they said? He's in shock. He's in shock. He didn't know. I said, I'm telling you, popcorn came out the steering wheel. Now watch this. As they were pulling me out, cars were lined up. And guess who was in the line? My mother. And my dad were coming home. They said, oh, Paul, look. That's a bad accident. She didn't know it was me because I was in Doris Roberts' car. She said, oh, we need to pray because there's no way anybody can survive that. And of course, they were doing this, you know, and, and it was pulling that car apart to get me out of there. So when I got, <laughs> when they finally got me, they rushed and they said, you have, you, you, who's your mother and father? I said, Paul and Velma, the plans, you got the number yet? Well, by that time, you know, I was at the hospital. They, they called mom. Well, mom and dad rushed in the car. She said, that's that uh, car we saw. And she come rushing and come running. You all right, boy? You all right? I said, I'm fine. You know, mom was a kind of crazy. The first thing she asked me, was your underwear clean? <laughs> I said, after the second flip, mama, I don't know what happened. That's all I can tell you. I want to make you laugh, but that's what mama said. That's exactly what my mama said. I just couldn't believe it. Good God, man. Daddy said, you all right? I said, dad, popcorn, come out the steering wheel. He said, son, you're in shock. I said, dad, popcorn, come out the steering wheel. They released me from the hospital, hit the front pages of the paper, impossible to live. Mama said, I saw that, that dream, that blood of Jesus was covering you. And I thought, Something was covering me. And then I told him about, I said, I had this pressure on my shoulder. There was no way. I mean, I said, it held me. Mama, if I'd have went over, it would have went right through me, you know, and just killed me. And she said, that was an angel of God. I said, well, something, Mama. I don't know what it was, you know. So anyway, I went home that night, and it took about three days. I got so sore. I literally pulled, I guess, every muscle I had in my body. And when I got out, you know, I said, Mom, I, said, Let's, I told my dad, let's go to the uh, wrecking yard. Because the car was totally total. Dad said, what do you want to do that for? I said, I'm going to go look at that car, Dad. He said, boy, I said, Daddy, let's go. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to show you something. And when we got there, when we looked inside the car, popcorn was all over the bottom of the floor. And what we ascertained was there was a bag of popcorn in the glove compartment. And as I'm flipping and things are breaking up, when the steering wheel broke in my hand, the, pop, the glove compartment flew up, bam, and the popcorn bag just came busted like that. And I went, Man, that's popcorn. That's what I was thinking, you know. And so it proved that I was not in shock. Now that was a close encounter of the God kind and, uh, and those things. Now I can, there's many of them. I can tell you, I've been translated. I can prove that from Monroe, Louisiana to Lafayette and made it in 30 minutes. And you can't do that with a jet. I can prove that because the people are still living uh, that uh, God sent me there. Didn't burn no fuel in any way, shape or form. And I was going up the overpass coming out of Monroe, going toward Alexandria, coming out. And, and I thought my car was on fire. Smoke filled up the hole. And I went, oh, my God. And when I, I, I found myself speaking in tongues, shouting, this is when I had become a preacher. My God, I mean, I would just speak. And I, and I remember my mind saying, put your hands on the, on the steering wheel, fool. And the next thing I noticed, I was on the Evangeline Thruway in Lafayette, Louisiana. And I had just left Sunny Day's office, who was a contractor in Monroe. I left at 10.35, and at 11 o'clock, I'm sitting there. Well, actually, 11.05. And I, caught, I stopped, I pulled off by Burger King, and I was supposed to stop and pray for a man's child who was sick in the hospital. And uh, to make a long story short, before I called Sunny Day, I got on the phone and I called the, I knew the, the, where the little girl was in, what room she was in. And when Ken, he, Ken the father, answered, they were screaming, and I heard the doctor say, we're losing her, we're losing her. She got 108 fever, 107, 108 fever, and she was in convulsion. And I, I said, Ken, I kept hollering at Ken, you know, and he was saying, my, my baby dying, my baby dying. She was uh, eight years old, seven, eight years old, something like that. My baby's dying. I said, Ken, put your hand on her now. Well, what? Put your hand on her now. And I said, I'm going to pray. And he said, oh, brother, I said, put, now holler at Ken, put your hand on her now. And he did, and I, in the name of Jesus, you devil from hell, get your hand off that child. And the baby went, boom, stop convulsing, opened up her eyes, said, mama, I'm hungry. <laughs> the doctors freaked out. This is all, I can prove all this physically. He said, but just as she's healed. I said, well, that's what I expected. 
Now, why did God have to get me there? Because he knew I had to be there to pray for that child. Now, I did something stupid. <laughs> I drove about two miles, pulled over on the side of the road, and I said, come on, Jesus, take me home. <laughs> and nothing happened. I mean, George, I spit and screamed, come on, Jesus. And I said, I got translated. So I said, well, if I did, I didn't burn no gas. And I turned the switch on the car, and it was completely full. And I had to drive all the way home. I was a little irritated about it. But you see, I, I, I didn't, nothing was a major to get home, but God put me in the right place, different close encounters of the God kind. And I can tell you many different things that have happened. I've seen many, many angels, and one of them, and I like to tell the ministers of that, I am a working machine. I love to work. And uh, I was having chest pains, but I didn't tell God. I was preaching every day, twice a day, just every day, just going at it. And uh, in those days, you stayed in either evangelistic quarters or you stayed in the pastor's house. And uh, I, I went to this church in Jonesville, Louisiana, and uh, I was just tired, boy. And so what I like to do, and I still do, is I like to put a scripture in my mind before I go to bed so the devil don't mess with my head when I'm sleeping. I got that scripture circulating in my brain, see what I'm saying, like that? And God will give me revelation. I mean, that's one time, Kathy, I was standing up in the middle of the bed, and I said, energize, immobilize, and finalize. I was preaching a tent meeting in my mind, and the, the ceiling fan was hitting my hair like this. <laughs> energize. And Kathy grabbed me, you stupid fool, pull me down. You know, I said, woman, I was in the middle of a great service. It's, you know, you pulled me down. Well, I'll never forget this. So I took my Bible like this, and I was reading the scripture, and I was sitting, and I, sitting up in the bed with my back against the headboard. And when I looked up, there was an angel about seven foot tall, blonde hair, Judy about the color of your hair. I went, whoa. Oh, and these dogs, I call them weenie dogs. Uh, dachshunds, is that right? They start barking and jumping and just barking. They could see them angels. And he looked at me, he said, I've been sent of the Lord to tell you to sleep. I mean, I was tired. Tell you to sleep. Now, I was in my early 30s then. And I remember, I said, okay. And the Bible fell on my chest like this. That was 12 o'clock at night. And I woke up at 12 o'clock noon the next day in the same position with the Bible on my chest. I felt like a million bucks. Well, the pastor, he didn't want to knock on the door because he said, I just must be real tired. I come walking out and he said, man, did you hear them dogs? He said, them dogs? I was so mad at them dogs. He said, but he couldn't see the angel because the dogs were more spiritual than he was. <laughs> That's true. I said, man, them dogs saw that angel. Okay, I'm going kind of fast because I don't want to hold you real long. I just want to get into the heaven thing. Many different things like that happened to me and still does. I mean, I, I, I spoke to an angel the other day right off of uh, Rawl Street. I ran into him. I knew what I was doing. He went, hey, Jesse. I said, hey, how you doing? Why, why are you? I don't know. I'm no better than anybody. I don't think I have any more faith than anybody. But I do enjoy the presence of God, and I have many great conversations with the Lord all the time. People ask me all the time, how long do you pray? I said, I don't pray a lot, but I have a lot of conversations. You know, and I say, hey, Jesus, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And then we just go on, man. And some of the funniest things have happened in my conversations with the Lord. Okay, I want to get to the heaven thing, because that's where y'all want to get at. 1988, Pastor Paul Trokel was pastoring Magnolia Christian Center. I had preached there before under the pastor leadership of G.C. Kirksey. I know these names like the back of, back of my hand. I went to preach, so. And I was put at the Best Western Hotel, room 105, there, and I started my meeting. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Well, we had a glorious service. And on, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday, I believe it was Monday, Sunday morning, Sunday was my third service because I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night. Pastor Paul said, let's have, let's, let's have lunch. And across the street from the Best Western Hotel was a, a, a steakhouse called Western Sizzler, a Sizzler, a Sizzling, something like that. And uh, I said, okay. He said, just meet me over there at, at 12 o'clock. I said, okay. 
So I walked across the street, and when I got there, there him and uh, I guess one of his associates was with him. Uh, I, didn't, I don't remember the gentleman's name. He said, well, Judge, you got to go in the line, pick your steak, and make potato, blah, blah, this and that. I said, okay. So we sat, and we did all that, you know. And when I sat down to put the steak down, I just, I heard the Lord say, go back to your room. Go back to your room now. Now, I know that voice. And I mean, I mean, the steak's, shh, you know, everything's hot. And I said, Pastor Paul, I got to get back. I got to go back to my room. And, and I said, let me pay for this. And I think I put $100 on the table. Oh, no. I said, he said, are you sick? Is something wrong? I said, no, nothing. I'm feeling good. I want to eat this steak. I said, but I got to get back to my room. I just, I just got to get back to my room. I said, I'll see you tonight, okay? Is that okay? Sure, but are you sure you're not sick? You sure? I said, no, I'm feeling fine. I, I, I said, but I, and then he asked me again, well, why you got to go? I said, I don't know. Okay. So, man, I went like that, and I opened up my room, and I took the do not disturb sign. I stuck it on the uh, doorknob, and I closed the door. And I knew something was heavy on me. And I, I said, man, I got to pray this thing out. I, I don't know what it is. And I looked at the clock, you know, with them little red lights, you know, like a clock that you see in a hotel, and it was like uh, 1 o'clock. And I knelt down. And I said, Lord, I, don't, I, you know, I started talking like me. I said, Lord, I don't know. And all of a sudden, I heard, I thought, my God, there's a tornado coming here. You know how a tornado sounds? And I went, oh, man. And I, I, I'm about ready to get up, and then, whoo, I was sucked out the room. I went, whoa. I mean, I literally hollered, whoa. I mean, you know, now, it wasn't a vision. I, how did you get through the ceiling? I don't know. I don't know any of that. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I don't know what I was in my body, out of my body. All I know, I went through that room. And I was put into this kind of a, uh, looks like a ski car, or but closed in. And it was the same blonde-headed angel that had talked to me in Jonesville, Louisiana. I went, hey, how you doing? He said, hi, Jesse. I said, where are we going? And, and it was, I mean, we were moving at a phenomenal rate of speed. And I think the only reason why I was in that contraption was to protect me, not to protect the angel. Because I'm in a flesh body. See what I'm saying? I mean, traveling at a phenomenal rate. He said, you have an appointment with the Most High God. I said, I do. What I do wrong? <laughs> now, I didn't put that in the book, but I asked him that. He said, you didn't do nothing wrong, or otherwise you wouldn't be here. He said, we'll be there just in a very short time. I, I, I don't know how fast we were going. I knew we were moving. Glenn, we were moving, man. I mean, and all of a sudden, I began to kind of like feel the brakes slowing down. And... He, 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 and he just stopped. He said, and he opened the door. And when he opened the door, I was in the most beautiful place I ever seen in my entire life. I never seen reds like that, blues, purples, gold, grays. When I say color, I mean color like I've never seen in my life. Because uh, there was no stain of sin on it. And I walked out. And the angel said, you're in paradise. I said, paradise? And I looked and I could see the city, which seemed like millions of mansions all around it. And it's a three-place tier. There's the throne. There's the New Jerusalem. Then there's paradise. See, paradise looks like country, beautiful green fields, valleys, mountains. And I was thinking in my mind, God, this looks a lot like earth. But the angel could hear me thinking, he said, it's the, Lord, the earth is the Lord's taste. I said, yeah, that's right. I said, man, glory to God. And you can't use praise phrases because they do it. You know how we say praise the Lord? Uh, glory. I went, glory to God. He goes, glory to God, glory to God. And I go, glory to God. And everybody around me goes, glory to God. You just got to watch what you say because they do it. Glory to God. And I'm shouting. And I look, and I, and, I, and I felt like the kneel down. He said, do not kneel before me. You have an appointment with the Most High God. And I looked, and I'm just standing there. It just, I just couldn't get over how beautiful. It was vast. It was here. Heaven's a planet. It's about the best way I can describe it in the natural. And I, 
I don't know what to do. And I, and I wanted to say, praise God, but I knew, but I did it anyway. I went, praise God. He goes, praise God. Yeah, I mean, and he didn't have wings, this, this angel, but there was a lot of them that did. And I mean, people start praising God. And here comes another one of them contraptions that I then. And it comes, I don't know who this, this person comes out and this man goes, I made it. I made it. I can't believe I made it. And he fell on the ground and started kissing the ground. I made it. I made it. And I thought, yeah, but you see, he didn't have clothes like I did. He had a gown on. How you know the people is clothes, the, uh, the clothes of office. Like if in the military, you know a general when you see him. You know a colonel when you see him. You know a lieutenant colonel when you see him. A full bird colonel. You know, and they, that, 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 that close of office dictates their position there in heaven. But this man had a gown. And there was another angel who said, let me guide you. Now, people were lining up, heading for that city as fast as they could. But they didn't have gowns. Some of them had gowns, but, but most of them had big robes on. Gorgeous robes with top stitching. Beautiful stuff. I mean, just, and I thought, man, look at the clothes in there. But all of a sudden, I saw the people with the gowns, they kind of get close, and they'd get out of line. And, and, and the angels would move them over to where the river of life was. And they would, they would eat a piece of fruit and take the leaves and do this. And I said, well, they're not going to go to the throne? He said, yes. But he said, the great God Jehovah is merciful. But they didn't live the way they were supposed to live. But the great God Jehovah was merciful. They will learn and eventually get to the throne. And I thought, man, I am something going wrong with me. I'm here and so. And then when I got back, I checked it out in the book of Isaiah. He said he gives us a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness, which is totally two separate things. And I physically saw that with my own eyes. That's why it's in the book of Isaiah, you ought to go read it. It's a garment of salvation, which means to show that they were saved, and a robe of righteousness. Now, as I, I thought, man, I'm looking like that in this. I was thirsty. The angel said, you're thirsty? I said, yes. He said, I'll get you some water. And this man said, I'll get him the water. And I looked. Oh, my, my short cord. I'm getting goosebumps. Excuse me a minute. Whoo. He's thick, barrel-chested man. He said, hello, Jesse. I'm your father in the faith. I'm Abraham. I went, and he, he's thick, barrel-chested, big man. You ought to have seen his clothes. You talk about a general. This boy was more than a four-star, five-star, ten-star. See, I, everything I thought about heaven was totally wrong. I thought Peter at the gate, that ain't true. No, no. You know, I just people saying all that kind of stuff. The first person you meet is your father of faith, Abraham. He said, you thirsty? I said, yes. He said, let me get you some water. And he had a goblet with sapphire and diamond and emerald. I thought, my God, look at that cup. He said, drink this. And I was dehydrated, and I would do this. I said, what's happening? He said, you're going to have to eat some fruit so you can withstand the glory of God. And that's why I knew I was in my physical body. Because if I was in a, uh, in a vision, I wouldn't have got weak, you know, or a spirit body or something like that. But I mean, I mean, I would do this and I'd do that. And the angel said, you okay? He said, and I started talking to him. And I just had a wonderful time. I want to just stay there and talk. And the angel said, we must move on. You have an appointment with the Most High God. I saw a man, the only other person other than Jesus that had a crown, he had a red beard, and that was King David. I saw him from afar, and Jesus assigned him to bring me to my house. But that's, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself right now, but we'll get to that in just a minute. So he gave me, and we start talking faith. Now, I didn't put this in. I said, I said, how'd you do it? I said, how'd you do it? Abraham, how'd you do How could you lay your boy down? He said, well, I had a choice, but I chose the right choice. He said, just like you. I said, oh, I didn't do nothing what you did. He said, yes, you have. He said, you don't know how God judges you until you get there. You think, well, I, you know, I'm just a normal little Christian about this. And, oh, but God has a different scale of moving and touching people. 
Like you, you know, we think, you know, this and that. We think God is far above all that. So I'm just talking to, and he hugged me and he laughed. And I thought, I'm being hugged by Abraham. You know, I just couldn't get over that. I was just sitting, and the angel said, Jesse. They didn't call me Brother Jesse. They didn't call me Reverend Jesse. They didn't call me Reverend Doctor or Brother. They just called me Jesse. That's what Jesus called me, Jesse. I never called him Reverend Christ. I just called him Jesus. First name basis. And I was trying to do something for the angel, and he said, no, no, we're servants here. I said, Abraham, let me do it. He said, no, no, we're servants here. We serve each other. You have an appointment with God Almighty. It's exciting. And I said, listen, we need to talk more. I said, can I stay here a while? I, no, you, they keep you on schedule, you know what I'm saying? Now, by this time, I'm seeing beautiful places. I mean, just places, just gorgeous. So I'm walking like that, and these flowers. The heads of the flowers are about this big, if everybody can see me. And they're beautiful. And I stopped. And the angel said, you can walk. He said, they're spiritualized. I said, what? He said, you won't crush them. Nothing dies here. He said, step. I stepped and it went through my legs. As I walked by, Judy, they like as if they could see me. They turned. I thought, my God. And I mean, big, head, beautiful flowers just waving in the breeze. I said, what is that? He said, that's the fluttering of angels' wings. He said, it's all over. I said, what's that wonderful smell? He said, that's the fragrance of God. Wow. I'm still looking for that smell. I smelled it one time just a little bit at Lakeside Mall. <laughs> I know that smell. I can't tell you what it is. But a lady walked by me and I just, I went, God, that's that smell. And I looked at her. That's when I was going to get one of them coats, uh, coats, you know, one of these uh, sport coats. And she said, how you doing, Brother Jesse? I said, you must be very close to God. She said, I am. It's a pleasure meeting you and walked off. I wanted to go. <laughs> you know, but she kind of walked off. But it was just a tinge, George. But I can't t explain to you how it smells. It just smells wonderful. And it, it just gives, it just goes in your body. And I'll never forget that as long as I ever live. So as I'm walking, nothing. I kept looking around, and I noticed that there were no shadows. So I asked that angel, I said, you're not casting a shadow. He said, God is light in whom there's no darkness, no shadow of turning. There's no darkness here. He wasn't quoting scripture. He was telling me there's just no darkness. Here. See, ladies and gentlemen, if you look up there, you see the, you see the shadows? And even though we got light in here, that doesn't happen. That doesn't exist in heaven. There's no darkness. There's no decay. There's no dust. Zero dust. None of that. That's decay. So think about that for a minute. So, when I, I, so I'm just walking and enjoying myself. But every time I, I wanted to stop, I, I, want, I wanted to look at things, you know. But I'm walking about this fast, I guess you could say. And the angel walking beside me, right? I mean, it was just amazing. a big old boy. I mean, big. All of a sudden, here come kids, like you girls, about her size. They come out, and in paradise, they're pavilions where they come out and sing and perform. And I asked Abraham, what are you doing in paradise? He said, paradise belongs to me. It's my bosom. I said, that's where Jesus walked over and went to Abraham's bosom and set the captive. He said, so you read the word. He said, it's my place. It's mine. That's his bosom. I said, yes. These little girls and boys coming, I mean bunches of them. And it looked like a harp to me, about the size of this we are. And they were playing, and they were singing. And I said, who's all these children? He said, these are children that the world did not want. He said, but the great God Jehovah is merciful. He said, and, and they love to play and sing for Jesus. I said, oh, okay. You know, and I said this, and they were just sweet, beautiful, and they had, on, they had on beautiful outfits. All of a sudden, I heard this. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming, and the kids begin to run in front of me. I said, where are they going? 
He said, bow. That's what the angel told me, bow. I hit my knees. And out of that city came a light. How do I say this? Lord, help me. Um, diamonds just clearing, closed. I mean, just, and, and I thought, my God. He said, power before the king of kings. That's what the angel did. I said, oh, yeah, man. I'm down, I'm down. And I start repenting. I said, Jesus, listen. Uh, he said, I've already washed it away, Jesse. Stand up. Stand to your feet. Uh, I said, listen, you, maybe I might have missed something. I, you know, because you, you, you know, there's such holiness. There's such purity. You understand what I'm talking about? Listen to me. So I stood up, and he's between 5'11 and 6'1. But his clothes look like a sheet of diamond, and light just emanating out of it. But in the thread, you could see the glory coming out of it. See, Jesus is the part of God you can touch. The heart of God is the Father. The face of God is the Son, Jesus. The voice of God is the Holy Ghost. But the hands of God is the church. Do you hear that? And he looked at me, he put his hand on his shoulder. He said, are you enjoying yourself? I said, yes. He said, I come to hear my children sing. I said, I said that's great. I said, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna listen too. And the kids start singing and playing. And it was phenomenal, Aubrey Otis. I mean, perfect song. Like, oh, just perfect. I just listened. And Jesus, they ran up to him. They would go in. See, they had a spiritual body. They would actually go in his glory. Me, I'd go, and John was like this, and I'd hit. You see, and I said, I need to get in there. And what happened is, in a new spirit body, you can go in between the molecules. That's why Jesus could go through the walls. Now, when he put his hand, I, I looked at the holes. I didn't realize how big those nails were. You know, I was thinking a hole like this. You see? I could see right through the holes at the ground. Then I saw this liquid like doing this. Now, I didn't put this in the book, but the Lord said I could reveal it. I said, what is that? He said, you know that statement I gave you? He said, that's liquid God. Like you have blood, this body doesn't have blood. This is a body you can hug. This is, you can hug the Father and the Holy Ghost through Jesus' body. I, and I thought in my mind, whew, whew, he must have, it looked like a railroad uh, spike. It, that, that big, ladies and gentlemen, in his feet. And it was the color of, uh, of not bronze, but a very shiny brass, what it looked like. But what it was was this glory coming out. And when I look into his face, the, if you would take a light and stick it behind my head, because my hair is so white, the TV freaks out. And I, you, and I was looking, I'm, I'm trying to get his features, but he turned his head like this, and he talked to that angel, and this part of the, I saw his head, it was light brown. He didn't have a beard. Now, I'm thinking like Jews do, you know, long. Mm -mm. And then when he returned, it was just pools of, I mean, just love coming off of him. Like you, you, you just, you get weak. And, Angel said, eat this so you can withstand the glory of God. He said, you have an appointment with my father and me and my spirit. I said, well, let's talk now. He said, you have to see other things. I'll meet you soon. And he walked off as the kids were singing and glorifying it. This just beautiful place. And I'd see the people all lining up trying to get to that throne, Randy. But then I'd see them people with gowns step out and go over, and they would grab those leaves. And I asked the angel again. I said, they're not going to go. He said, the great God Jehovah is merciful. He said, but they have to learn some things. He said, but they will get there. And that's the one with the different color, uh, the, the gowns. You see what I'm saying? Instead of those rules. There were some people just walking like this, heading straight to that throne. It was amazing. Everybody wants to get to the throne. The throne is 1,500 miles high. You can see God from all directions. As we were walking, I'm getting close to the city. I saw mansions after mansions and mansions. I mean, just, I'm not talking about small places. I'm talking mansions. 
and I came up to the Jasper wall and I said, stop. I preach on this. I want to look at this. And I saw the names of the apostles. The first one was Peter. The second one was Paul. The third one was James. The fourth one was John. I didn't put this in the book. I said, why James is ahead of John? He said he was the first martyr. He deserved that position. I said, Paul. I said, you know, he wasn't in the original 12. He said, I'll never forget what the angel said. He was original to God. Wow. I didn't put that in the book, but he told me, I said, okay. I said, listen, I got, I, 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 want, I, want, I, want, I want to watch. He said, no, you, I have to keep moving you. And that's when David came up to him. And I looked at him, and he had a red beard like Keith Moore's beard. It wasn't shaggy, you know, it was very well manicured. You never seen beards. And he goes, hello, Jesse. Everybody knew my name. I said, it, when I, man, I saw that cry. I went down. He said, don't power at me. You've just met the king of kings. Buddy, he has got a position. He is the king of Israel. Even there, you can see that. He said, no, stand, don't, don't bow to me. You just met the kings of kings. I've been assigned by Jesus to take you around, take you to your house. I said, okay. So we start walking. I said, you was a musician, weren't you? He said, yes, I was. He said, you a musician too? I said, yes, I am. I said, I wrote a lot of songs. He said, so did I. I said, yeah, I read some of them. <laughs> Zach words. He said, well, which ones did you like? Well, I said, I like them all, but the one I really liked was the Psalms 23. He said, I did my best on that. He said, you know why? Now I'm going to reveal some things. He said, because you see, I just let the Lord speak through me. He said, some of my songs, he said, I sang about troubles. He said, you know, us musicians, a lot of times, we, sing, we do what we call uh, stories in the songs, you know? Like, today I passed you on the street. It's an experience that happened, and you make a song out of it. He said, but when I, when I would talk about the worship of God, he said, those were much better. They were good. He said, but he said, you know what I'm talking about? I said, yeah, I wrote a lot of songs that you write. That's how songwriters get their, their ideas from experiences and things that happen in their life. He said, but I wish I'd have done a lot more when I praised and worshiped him instead of some of the songs about some of my troubles. He said, they were still good, but it was so much better when I just talked about how wonderful and how glorious he is. So we just talked, and he said, I've been, I've been told to go to your house. I want to bring you to your house. I said, okay. So I'm just talking. We're talking music. Okay, I'm getting weaker by the minute. He said, give him some fruit. It was a piece of fruit about this big. Look a little bit bigger than a... a a very small pea, uh, what do they call that? A pea? The one that's purple, Kathy. Plum, yeah. And, and I would eat that and I would just feel strength. Whew. And I asked him, and this is not in the book, I said, I don't know about e Enoch and Elijah. He said, what do you want to know? I said, well, they came up here like what I'm at. He said, that's right. How can they stand it? Because they got to be eating probably 10 billion pieces of fruit by now <laughs> to handle this. And he said, God Almighty, spiritualize their bodies so they could operate and function like everyone else here. Oh. I said, okay. Now, in the Mount Transfiguration, Jesus was so bright, but notice this, when, when, he, when he dialed up, they could barely see. and He had to dial it back down. But when he came out of that city, he was so bright. And there was a glory coming out of his clothes. I mean, you could actually see the, the threads, just glory being emitted everywhere, all over his body. So we're walking like that. And he said, uh, before we go to your house, let's go in this house. I think you'll enjoy this person. I said, okay. So I walked in, and I saw a bald-headed man about this tall, which is about, what, five foot three, two? And he was sitting on the windowsill. And there was about seven or eight people around. He was teaching the word of God. And he looked at me. He said, hello, Jesse. I said, my God, that's the apostle Paul. I said, hello. He said, how you doing? I said, this place is great. He said, I've been wanting. He said, during my life, I wanted to get here so bad. But I had to stay, you know, to help the church. So I sat down. And he looked at me. I said, let me tell you something, Paul. If you came back to the earth, you could sue me for copyright infringement. 
I preach all your stuff. And he laughed. He just thought that was so funny. I was serious. I mean, I preach these epistles. I preach everything he said. And I said, you know, I, I, you said the same thing that uh, you don't know whether you was in the body or out of the body and you was caught up. He said, just like you. You have experienced what I experienced when I had a physical body. I said, that's, man, this is heavy. And he said, it is. I said, what was your greatest surprise? And tears came. He said, Jesse, I never thought that God would make my words his words. He said, I was writing to the churches, you know, to do my job as an apostle. He said, well, when I got here, God said, Paul, because of your love for me, because of your tenacity, I made your words my words. He said, my words became holy canon. I said, Lord, I said, well, I'll tell you what, you sure did some great stuff. He said, I got a lot more that I'm going to teach once everybody's here. I said, I'm, I'm going to your Bible study. <laughs> he just laughed. It was so funny. See, you could talk to one or you could talk to millions. That's how the, 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 the language is. You see what I'm saying? It's just to I me mean, like Jesus could talk to you, yet talking to millions of people. And so I'm talking, and I'm keep on talking, and the angel and David said, uh, you have an appointment. I said, I, 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 we need to talk some more. He said, before you go, you know when I wrote to my church in Corinth that I light affliction is but for a moment? I said, yeah. I said, I preached that. He said, the church made it a lifetime. Then he leaned over to me, Gigi, like this. He said, do me a favor. Change it back to a moment. I said, I'm yours to command. I'll change it back to a moment. I said, I'll tell you what, man. I, can, I said, persecution don't make nothing to me. I don't care what they say. He said, you're a lot like me about that. I said, but I haven't been beat up like you. You know, I, he said, you know, but he said, I he said, I wouldn't. He said, don't even be concerned about the tribulation I went through. My whole body will beat me. I was thinking, man, I'm, maybe they'll kill me and I can get to heaven. <laughs> he said, I could care less about all that. I was interested in one thing. Come in here, stay in here, and start my eternal work. Ladies and gentlemen, God hadn't stopped creating. The universe is expanding right now as we speak, faster than the speed of light. That's God. He's a creator. So I said, listen, I want to come back and talk. He said, okay, thank you. He said, Jesse, thanks for coming to my home. I said, you got a nice house. He said, wait till you see yours. I said, you been to my house? Yeah, he said, Jesus personally built it for you. Now, let me back up. When Jesus put his hand on my shoulder, he said, go tell my people I'm coming. Now, you got to watch. Sometimes he would talk to me. I could physically hear, and yet he could hear my thoughts, and he would answer me in my thoughts. And I said, Lord, you got the wrong man here. I said, I'm just, a, I'm, just a, I'm just a evangelist preaching Sunday through Wednesday meetings. This is 1988, you know. I said, you need Billy Graham. Go tell my people, okay, you need somebody like that. And he just smiled. He said, no, you will do it. What I did not know, what I signed in prior for Eric today on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, PBS, I'm on all those channels. I'm preaching to 2.9 billion people in 14 different languages. And since January 20, uh, 2020 to the end of April of this year, over 19,300,000 people have contacted us on social media. Yeah. Views, comments, you know how to do all that stuff. And we, our people are running nine and nothing just to keep up with all this stuff. And what are we telling them? Jesus is coming. So I asked the Lord, I was going to reveal this at the end, but he said, you can do it now. I said, why are you making me do this, Lord? He said, I brought you here to tell everybody that I'm coming. He said, and then you tell everybody I'm coming sooner than they think. Write that down if you're taking notes. Now, he didn't tell me when he was coming, but he's coming sooner than you think. As I'm walking, I'm running into horses. You talk, Lori, you ain't seen horses like that. My God. What's so wonderful about the animals, you can hear them think. They can talk to you. You can talk to them. Cats, I saw cats, little ones. 
big cats, lions, tigers, horses, dogs. Now, I ain't saying your dog went to heaven. I'm just saying I saw dogs. I don't know. I, I can't, I can't, I, don't put some words in my mouth. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. But I, I mean, animals. And I, I just looked at one horse and he, and he just looked at me and I could hear him thinking. And he said this, thanks for coming. I said, where's that white horse that Jesus, I didn't see it, but I wanted to. Because I love horses. I think they're just beautiful animals. I mean, all over, lambs and lions playing, like it says in the Bible, just playing around. And you see the little babies and those children, they would run up to Jesus and he would hug them and they would hug him. It was amazing. He said, we got to move you faster. I said, okay. He said, we'll come back. So as I begin to walk, you know, I begin to get to that throne. I really begin to get weak there. Oh, man. So I held on to that angel's arm. I mean, I'm doing this. And he said, eat this. I said, I hope you got a lot of fruit in there, man. I said, this is, and I would, you know. And when I walked in it, it was like millions of people standing before that throne. And I heard this. And that's God's sound. The Father, that's energy, that's power. I cannot, I don't know how to explain that. Such power and smoke. And there was these angels, cherubims, at least 30 foot tall, with a 30 foot wing spread. But the one, and that's big, but the ones that blew me away was those seraphims with the three, with the six wings. And they put the wings over their, um, uh, their feet. I said, what, why? He said, they go as messengers that God sends them, and they don't want, if they have to have a dust on their feet, they cannot approach God. And those cherubims begin to fly around that throne. I bit the dust. I hit the ground. I couldn't stand up no more. And I'm trying to look, and, I hear, and I'm hearing, holy, 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 the great God Jehovah. Amen. I'm looking again, and I, grab, I begin to kind of get strength, and the power and out of that fog and that power comes Jesus Christ in human form. And he came out just like this. I saw the difference between the Father and the Son. But I saw Jesus, he'd talk and then he'd turn around. They can't stay away from each other very long. He'd go back into that smoke. Man. And you hear power, boy, just like if, 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 if the father would just move a fingernail, just annihilate a universe, just such power. And then he'd come out. And I always thought of Jesus as a teacher. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's wrong. Now, he can do that. He came out of there, and there was thousands, of, millions, actually. And he went, I'm going to get your brothers. I'm going to get your sisters. I'm going to get your family. Now, let me tell you what I thought of. I thought, my God, he's like R.W. Schambach. He can preach. He's a, he's a preacher. R.W. Schambach was very dear to me. And I don't know if y'all know who he was, but that's a powerful man. He's in heaven today. I mean, preaching up a storm. People falling out. I saw where the 24 elders were, but they were not in their chairs. I said, where the elders? He said, they're in the city. They're in paradise. We're servants here, Jesse. We're servants here. Everybody's saying, what can I do for you instead of you trying to do something for them? And I thought, my God, the only other seats that are on that throne is where humans sit. And angels don't sit. They stand at attention because they're servants. We're sons and daughters. Okay? I mean, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And I'm just trying to grasp it. And I saw God... The, the, like the hand of God. This is the Father. And, and I was trying, and watch my finger here if I can get this, if you can get a good shot of this. Now them angels, you know why they say holy, holy? They've been doing that for trillions and trillions of years. And every time they make a circle around the throne, they see a side of God they've never seen before. And they proclaim, holy, 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 the great God Jehovah. Now watch my finger here. And I, so I'm, I'm, I'm like this man, like, and he did this. And when he did, one of them angels, bam, just blew him up against the wall. Didn't hurt him, just bam. And I thought, my God, if this father just moves the wrong way, it's over. <laughs> this creator. 
So I understand the Trinity because I saw the Father. But I couldn't look into the brightness, but I could just barely, you know. I saw the Son Jesus, now I could hold him. And I asked the stupidest question anybody could ever ask in heaven on the floor. The angel said, I said, where's the Holy Spirit? Because, you know, I want to understand the Trinity and the natural side. And he said, he's on the earth. I said, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, 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 I felt so stupid. Why would you ask such a stupid question? You idiot. You know? <laughs> I met a family as I was going toward the throne that was killed in an airplane accident. There were six of them. And they said, hey, Jesse. I said, y'all know me? We know everybody here. I said, what y'all doing? They said, we're going on a picnic in paradise. You want to go? I said, yeah. The angel said, you can't. You, 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 you've got to do this. You've got to do that. They said, well, when you get back, we'll go, we'll go on a picnic. He said, I said, okay. He said, well, I, I will remember. I said, I will too. And they just they're playing. And I saw them like a husband and wife thing. And I asked the question, George. I said, uh, now I always kind of heard that you don't live together, you know that, you know, the body and the bride of Christ, you know, you, he said, oh, no, you can. Yeah, he said, yeah, you know your wife, your wife know her, you can live together. He said, but it's not like the way you think. It's so much higher than that. He said, Jesse, we are covenant family, all of us. And I thought, so you'll be with Randy. Yeah, but higher than ever your marriage was, much greater. So I, I'm, I'm hearing all these things, and I'm listening to him preach, I said, my God, man, listen. And I just wanted to stay there. People, when he would preach, they'd fall out by the hundreds of thousands. Even in their spirit bodies, bam, they would hit the ground. It was the most amazing thing. I'm just looking, and I'm just laying flat, man. And he's feeding me fruit. I got juice running down my cheek and everything. But, I, but when I would bite, I, I, I could feel like a surge of strength would come so I could withstand the glory of God. I knew if I tried to stand up and look and into the Father, like Moses said, you can't, I, I'd have died. I, I, I know it. I, now, I didn't meet Moses, but I saw him afar off. He's a very big man. And I noticed his clothes, all them patriarchs. Whoo, you ought to see that robe they got. You can tell the distinct, different things. And, uh, and so the people will find, they all want to get to their throne to get around God himself. And I, I was looking around, and I thought, hmm. I asked the angel, I said, why can't Jesus and the Father be apart very long? He said, love, love. He said, remember, when, which I just told you. He said, when we go out to the city, he said, I want you to remember what you asked me. I said, okay. You know, and, and I'm just looking, and I just couldn't, and, and, and I wanted to repent, but I didn't have nothing to repent because it doesn't exist. Now, in my mind, I could remember stuff. They don't remember anything. It's washed away, never to be remembered again. There's nothing. You don't hear repenting in heaven. It doesn't exist at all. There's people there you never thought were there. Now, I'm probably going to get some headache on this. But the Lord said I could say it. I saw President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I saw him. I said, that's the President of the United States. He said, the great God Jehovah has been merciful. I knew not to ask another question. <laughs> now, I don't know what that meant. Now, I know somebody's going to get mad at me about that, but I'm sorry. I'm just telling you what I saw. I've never revealed that till tonight. Because I thought, who would believe me? And what good would it do? I asked the Apostle Paul, was you married? Some people think you had a son. You know what he said? <laughs> he said, the reason why I didn't put any of that in there, what good would that do? I want people to recognize the message. He said, that's why you don't know nothing about Jesus from he's 12 till he's 30. What good would that do you? You need to hear and be witness to his message and what's going on. And I went, oh, yeah, I got that. Okay, I understand. I just wanted to know. He just smiled at me. I wasn't giving up. I said, I won't tell nobody if you tell me. 
He did the same thing you did. He just laughed. He didn't say nothing. I don't know. Maybe you can ask him when you get there. But I wanted to know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just nosy. There's so many things I could, I could go for hours, the different little things. But as I begin to just look, I had accomplished that. He said, we need to walk out again. I'm going to take you to your home. And King David was bringing me around. So we were talking. He's a very fine man. And I ran into Jonah. And I went down the street of the prophets. I know where Brother Hagin's living. CJ, I know the houses he's in. They look like St. Charles Street in New Orleans and Manhattan back in the 1800s where they had block mansions. And if it's the only city left in the United States that has block mansions is the city of New Orleans. For you that travel, if you want to say, it's on St. Charles Street, they call it the Garden District. Go down there, every block is covered with a mansion. And that's where the prophets live and the patriarchs. It's amazing to see that. And I asked Jonah, I said, hey. He said, hey, Jesse. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. I said, I want to ask you a question. Yes. I said, how did it feel to be in that fish? <laughs> I thought that was a viable question. I didn't know if it was a whale, fish, whatever. He said, Jesse, you're focusing on the wrong thing. I was in disobedience. He didn't say nothing, Kevin, about the fish. He didn't say a thing. He said, I was in disobedience. He said, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking how I was breathing, living. I was thinking, you idiot, you're in disobedience. And if I ever get out of here, I am going to do what God told me to do. But you know, he even got mad after God told him to do. Because, you know, God was merciful. See, some of you don't think JFK could be there. Well, none of the people from Nineveh should have been there neither. But God was merciful. They, Ninevites, they repented. JFK repented. Now, what he done, I don't know. That's none of my business. I saw him. He didn't have a robe on. He had a gown. But you knew who it was. And the other people, I passed this building. It was a huge building. I said, I'd like to go in there on the way to my house. He said, you're not allowed to go in there. You can't see what's in there. And I knew CJ immediately that I don't ask that question no more. I still don't know what's in that building, but it was huge. It looked like the Pentagon. You know how big that building is? Not a Pentagon per se like the Pentagon, but that big, that size of a building, huge. I don't know what's in there. And at the throne, I saw something I'll never forget as long as I live. In the smoke, I saw babies coming out. They had the ability to fly. And they had, Charlie, they had little nightgowns on. That's the only way I can say that. And I said, what is that? He said, that's the thoughts of God. I said, what? He said, that's the thoughts of God. When God thinks, he thinks children. And I could hear the little voice that said, would you make me a spirit? Would you make me a spirit? See, the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotion, the thoughts. And God would go, you could see him just leaving the breath of God. Now I couldn't, because of the fog. You'd see him come out the fog. And they were placed into, became a living spirit and was placed in the womb. So, if you've had an abortion, or you've had a miscarriage, your babies are alive. They're alive. And listen to me. If you recently had a miscarriage or whatever, and you don't live much longer, let's say you pass away, you teach your children the oracle of God. You. They can't wait to see their parents. They can't wait to see their mother. Now, if you wait a long time, there are people teaching them, you know, as you grow older, then they, they, they grow faster than a normal child, like this, these sweet girls, but but they're being taught the oracle of God. But let's say you had a miscarriage four years ago, five years ago, and you went home to be with the Lord or something like that. You would teach your own child the oracle of God. And they're waiting to see you. Now, when he breathes, life takes place. When I saw my mother breathe her last breath, God brought me to my attention of Adam. 
He said, when I breathed into his nostrils, he became a living spirit, lives. When someone dies and you see him do this, God is this close to their face and he receives that breath back into the giver of life. And when my mama breathed the last breath, I said, God, he went, yes. He received my mother back into him. The breath, every time God breathes, life comes forth. So when he thinks children and they make requests, would you make me a spirit? I heard him. And I mean, when he would breathe, it seemed like thousands of them were going out to become living spirits, to be raised as children like you see today. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And I thought, why? Because he's a creator. He breathes himself. And that's how life begins. You see what I'm saying? Then all the mechanical parts start taking place. But you've got to have that spirit. You take that spirit out that body, it's over with. I don't care what they do. They can put you on life support and keep your body alive and you gone. I mean, they could think, oh, they say it's your heart. No, your spirit's not there. For direction, for what the body doesn't know what to do, it needs a soul, spirit to the soul, the soul to the body, so he can understand how to function in this life. And David opened up the door of my house. He said, Jesus made a table for you. I said, he did. And I love foyers. To me, foyers dictate what a house should look like. And this house of mine is God. I, they say I live in a mansion. It's an odd house. <laughs> Nothing compared to what I got in heaven. And I got a beautiful home. Don't misunderstand me. Oh, I walked in and I walked up and this table has two gold eagles sitting, looking at each other. And one wing is like this. He said, the Lord personally made that for you. I said, my God, I'm doing good. Huh? He said, yes, you are. I just said, look around. I said, wow. And it was a lot of my own taste that I have here. Louis the 15th, Louis the 16th, a cabriole leg, you know, straight, curvy. I kind of like that kind of furniture. And I said, God, why is that? He said, every desire is given. He's, and David said, would you like a condo in paradise? I said, can I have one? He said, you can have a mansion in paradise. Anything you ask is given. All desires are met. Every desire you can think of, God does. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? It's the same way here, if you'll believe it. It's the same way here, if you'll believe it. And I, that's why I saw all those beautiful condos and places. People like, they like, got a mansion. Everybody want to live in, in the New Jerusalem the city, but they like to go out to the country. You can have that too. It don't, whatever you ask, whatever, it's no problem. And the Lord told me, he said, I'll do the same thing on the earth if somebody just believe me. That's my theme this year. What shall I do for thee? He didn't make a limitation on it. We do. People do. That's God. Be in God. So as I was walking, I came out of my house. Jesus came up on the street. Whew, I hit my knees, you know. And he just laughed. He was laughing. He tapped me on the show. Stand up, Jesse. Go tell my people I'm coming. He got stern with me then. I said, Lord, they know you're coming. And he raised his voice a little bit. He said, no, they don't. You go tell them I'm coming. I said, yes, sir. I'm yours to command. I will do that. That's why I work so much. Because I, I can hear that command coming at me. Do this. Do that, you know. So it's hard for me to, uh, quote, quote, slow down. And I was sitting there. I mean, standing there and we're just talking. I said, thanks for the table. He said, I, I did my best. I said, this is nice. He said, I thought so. I knew what you like and I did your taste, but I added some of mine in there. I said, well, every time I look at it, I'm going to think of you. He said, thank you, Jesse. He never called me, brother. And I'm just thinking, he said, it's time for you to go to work. It's time for you to go home. He said, David, take Jesse back to the, take him by the way of the mountains. He likes mountains. 
I said, thank you. He said, remember, go tell my people I'm coming. I guess that's why I work so much. I, I'm under command from God Almighty through the lips of Jesus Christ. That's why I know the difference between the voice of the Father, the voice of the Son, and the voice of the Holy Ghost. I've heard him physically many times since then. And I know the distinctness of each and every one of them. And then I, all of a sudden they come into harmony. And they all speak as, the three speaks as one. It's the most amazing thing you've ever heard. And as, but you're not going to know that unless you fellowship with God, see. It's more than going to church. That's good, but you got to do that. So as I was walking, the Apostle Paul came up to me. Abraham came up to me. Jonah came up to me bunch of people I didn't know. I never saw my mom. And let me say, I never saw any of my family. I know they were there. Maybe I, I wouldn't want to go or something. I don't know. Or maybe it wasn't time for that. I don't know. I can't explain that. And Paul looked at me and he goes, and he clenched his fist. He went, preach this gospel. I said, I'm going to preach this gospel, Paul. I am going to do it. He goes, come on. I said, yes. And, and David said, sing. I said, I don't sing much anymore, you know, because I preach so much. He said, just let every word be a song. And Jonah said, obey. <laughs> I, I revealed that tonight. Obey. He said in a kind of a whisper, obey. And I thought, yeah, because if I don't, I'll wind up in a fish myself. I guess that's what I was thinking, you know. <laughs> obey. And that's what I do. And when you understand what I'm talking about, you'll realize and know without a shadow of a doubt that uh, this longing for me, I want to get out of here. I've been there. I'm not looking to be a big preacher. I lost all that craziness. I, I won't exploit this thing. But I got to tell you something. I saw Jesus cry. When I would look into his face, it was so bright, but I saw tears. He said, I'll never forget this as long as I ever live. He said, my worst day is yet to come. I thought the worst day was the crucifixion. It's the judgment. He said, Jesse, you know, when I said in my word, I will wipe away all tears. I said, yeah. He said, that includes me too. I said, what? He said, Jesse, I can't change it. I can change it now because I'm their savior. He said, at that day, I won't be their savior. I'll be their judge. And I will have to declare the law of God. I can't change it. I have to wipe my own tears. And Charlie had tears, and I saw water fall from his. I almost wanted to pick it up for like, hold this, something, you know? And he had tears, he said, I don't want to tell my creation to part from me. You work of iniquity. I don't want to do that. My worst day is yet to come. And then he said this, you'll see it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be a tough day for God Almighty, for Jesus himself. He said, I can change it now. Preach that gospel, Jesse. That would be one less that I have to say depart. There'd be one less tear I have to shed. I don't want to do this, but I must. I said, okay, Lord. Then he said this, take care of yourself. Watch over your body. Satan don't care if you live or die. What he cares about is where you are. If you die and go to heaven, he says, good, I got him out of my hair. If you die and go to hell, well, bless God, he, he deserves what he got. He said, well, you, you give him trouble is on earth. He was seeing all, with all these men, great men like Jonah, and I looked at Paul and I went, he went, Psh. so I haven't obeyed that all. Uh, uh, I miss God on some of that. I'd get so tired, I could holly. Until the Lord had a child, 
a young man give me a word of knowledge. And he brought me back to heaven. He said, Brother Jesse, the Lord told me to tell you something. I said, tell me, young man. He's just a kid. He said, you know, the devil's afraid of you. You get in front of you, you run him over, kick him in the head. He just, you just beat him and walk on him. I said, I like that word. He says, so he quit getting in front of you and got behind you and start pushing you. Come on, you don't need to rest. My God, the people dying and going to hell, boy. Come on, preach, preach, preach. He says, so you'll never complete your destiny or reach your destination because the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. That went off of me like a shotgun, and I heard the Lord say, ah, take care of your body. I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'll say it publicly. That at times, I missed it again. I just, you know, Jody or Kathy will say, go home, take a nap, do something. And I, but this, this command, I'm going to be 72 in about a month and a half. This command, I hear it 24-7. Not to be big, I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to stand before him in that great day and said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Uh, but I have to learn to listen to this, this flesh. And I'm in not bad shape for a man my age. Most of my staff can't stay up with me. I'm not bragging about that. But there's been time God has told me to rest and I didn't. I'm going to be honest with you. And then I'd have to repent over it. He said, I appreciate your tenacity. I appreciate your willingness to work. But it's much more for you to do. You know, most of the people I started out with, Randy, they dead or retired. Most of them you have too. I ain't looking to play golf. I wouldn't mind white, watching that white horse run. <laughs> I like watching horses race, you know, they're beautiful. It's just that I'm, I'm about the father's business. But I have to be careful. I don't want Satan to use that. And the Lord has warned me about those things. And I believe that's a word for some of you in here. Because you have to complete your destiny and reach your destination. So I stepped into that contraption. And they said, we'll see you soon. And I thought, soon? This was 33 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. I was 39. But a thousand years is one day with the Lord. As far as they're concerned, I'm only, I was there 25 minutes ago. The millennial kingdom is only two days, a thousand year reign. That's one day, that's it. Jesus may have only been gone a weekend on his time frame. So if you've had a wife or a father or a mother or an uncle or an aunt, a grandparent that's went home in the last 25, 30 years, they've only been up there maybe eight minutes. Their time, not yours. I saw that. I wanted to know that man that said I made it. Uh, so as I was coming back, going at a phenomenal rate of speed. I don't know if I got out the Milky Way galaxy or not. I don't know. Because it was going so fast. And the next thing I know, I'm like this, by the bed. And the first thing I did, where's the hole? How did I get out of here? <laughs> and I had been in heaven five hours and 15 minutes. And I looked at the clock and I went, oh my God. God, oh man, it's 6.15, they're going to pick me up at quarter to seven. I got to preach tonight. Now, what I didn't notice, John, I was lit up like a light, but I couldn't see it, CJ. I'm shaving. I'm taking a quick shower, shaving, brushing my teeth, doing everything. And this man that was picking me up, he would, he'd just talk all the time when he picked me up, which was fine, you know. And it, 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 it's, uh, you know, 6.45, pop, pop. 
I heard him knock. I said, man. So I just finished. I said, I'll be there in just a minute. You know, and I, when I opened up the door, he went. And he just backed away and didn't say nothing. And I just looked at him. I said, okay, let me get my Bible. I'll be out. He didn't say one word to me going over to the Magnolia Christian Center. Now, before, he'd been talking like crazy. I was lit up like a light, but I couldn't see it. I brushed my teeth. I shaved. You know, I showered. I did everything. You know, nothing. So I never thought. I got there at 7 o'clock. Service starts at 7. Now, I can prove this. When I got out the car, the man, he was just... I thought, what's, maybe I offended him. You know, John, I thought maybe I said something. You know, I don't know. So I walked into the church. You walk into the foyer of the church, and you turn this way to go into the sanctuary. Now, that church has aisles on the side like that. Uh, then, I don't know how it is now, and just big, huge, long pews. So I'm going to walk on the side of the building like this. And Randy, I'm lit. And everybody started, they stood up and looked at me. And then they looked at the lights. I was shining. I was lit up, but I couldn't see it. They thought it was the TV lights. There was no spotlights. I didn't know anything. I couldn't see nothing. You know, I'm talking about me. This is me. You know, just me. So as I was walking up, I walked up the step. They got them little, real short pews that they have on the platform back in those days. You know, the little ones. And Paul Troker looked at me and went, and just backed up and went like that. I said, you going to give me the pulpit? It's three minutes after seven. Ain't they going to sing? So, but I was shining, and everybody could see it but me. So I stood before the pulpit. I said, I ain't saying nothing about this. People think I'm crazy enough as it is. I ain't saying nothing about this at all. I stood before the people. There was 800 people there. I said, ladies and gentlemen, I have been in the presence of God today. Boom, 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 and they all fell down. I didn't have one person standing. So I sat down on the platform for 30 minutes. You know how long 30 minutes is when you can't talk? <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Like they've been shot. People were crawling, trying to get out of the church. I didn't, I, I didn't say nothing about it. They've been got up and I preached a little bit, and we had a great service. They were weak, but the slow, like Moses, how he went before the presence of God, he had to put something on his face. Slowly, it began to fade to me, you know. But I never saw that. I can honestly say, I, I mean, I looked in the mirror, Terry, I shaved. I didn't see any of that. I got back home, I said, I ain't telling Kathy nothing neither. <laughs> but I said, I got to tell this woman something. I said, Kathy, sit down, I want to tell you something. And we get a knock on the door, and it's uh, Deborah and Jules Bokeh, my, her sister, my brother-in-law. So I thought, well, I'm just holding my peace. I said, but nah, they were on my board. I said, I want y'all to listen to this. And I'm about ready to start talking. And Deborah, her sister, says, you know, I had the strangest dream last night. I said, you had a dream? Yeah, she said, I was sitting down with my four kids. She said, but I don't have four kids. I only have three kids. I have Jules Jr., Julie, and Ryan. And I looked at her. I said, Deborah, you had a miscarriage, didn't you? She said, yeah. I said, Deborah, you got four kids. And I told her that. And Deborah, remember that? She bust out crying. I mean, and before you know it, Kathy's praising God, Jules praising God. I thought about it, Kevin, don't say nothing because they're going to fall on the floor and praise God, you know. Because <laughs> when you can't just say those words, they do it. That's, that's a reaction and an action. And she bust up. I said, Deborah, you got four kids. I saw that one. Was he a boy or a girl? It looked like a boy to me. And he kept looking at me, the little boy. <laughs> well, I'm his uncle. But I don't know that. You want to know if Jesus is coming? Every time the government gets involved in killing babies, God sends a deliverer. Pharaoh start killing babies and God sent Moses. Herod start killing babies and God sent Jesus. We're killing babies again and ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming. Back.
And I'm going to close with this. I held it very long. And Brother Copeland asked me and Jerry asked me if I would come to the minister's conference. That's when you're in the little building. And Buddy Harrison was sitting behind me. Now, this is years later. This is not the beginnings of me being with Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And the Lord said, go home and write that book. I said, God, I ain't writing that book. I said, people think I'm crazy enough as it is. I said, I can't write that. And Buddy Harrison tapped me on my shoulder. I said, hey, buddy. He said, Jesse, I don't mean to intrude, but the Lord just told me to tell you to write that book. Good God Almighty. At the mouth of two witnesses, God and Buddy Harrison. And I went home and talked to Kathy about it. I said, okay. So I went to Harrison House. And I sat down. Remember they were in that camouflage war with the hats on? We're going to war. He said, okay, Jesse, start talking. I talked for eight solid hours. They were taping everything I said. He said, there was there snow in the mountains. I said, yeah. He said, was it cold? I said, what, good, what difference does that make? He said, when you're writing a book, people will see expression on your face and understand what you say. But a book, you got to write that down. I said, no, it wasn't cold. Come to think about it, I touched it. But I knew it was snow. Which means if you like skiing. <laughs> every desire. And we wrote that book. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the first charismatic speaker or, or preacher to cross over into the secular market back then. That book, Close Encounters of the God Kind, became number three in the nation. I mean, it's ministered to literally millions of people all over the world. The finances that I made on it, I gave 100% of it to God's work. That's all that television was paid for and all the different things. God has been so good. And it is still <laughs> selling like crazy. And people steal it and do all kinds of things. I could put them in jail, but I don't do that because they're going to go to jail for life if they don't repent. But I mean, God is so good and gracious. Now, the Lord told me, he said, to ask you this in your own private self, if you've enjoyed this and maybe you'd like to have an experience, he wouldn't mind giving you that himself. You have to pray it out. I don't know how long it'll take. It could happen tonight. It may take years. All of my life after I got saved is I wanted to see God. My last story. <laughs> we had a terrible and full gospel temple. Remember that, Betty? Betty's father used to come and preach there. Brother Hander Garrison. And they were having a revival. And I had been asking God to see it. And I said, you showed yourself to Abraham. And I was a baby Christian. You know, I just got out the music business and been in that church maybe about a year, if that much. And he said, young man, stand up. And I was 26. He said, you've been asking to see the Lord. Lord, I got my attention real quick. He said, the Lord said he's coming to see you. I said, okay. He said, you'll be sleeping in the bed and your maid, mate, Captain Maid, is said, will not wake up. I said, okay. Well, I went home. I thought it was going to be that night. I stayed up all night. Nothing. <laughs> I stayed up three nights. Nothing. I was so tired, tired I could barely walk. I said, oh, that guy must have missed it. Two weeks passed. I was frustrated. And I went to bed. Catherine's on the side. I didn't pray, come see me. I was still a little irritated. Because in my mind, Randy, the guy, just, he got excited. I don't sleep on my stomach anymore, but in those days I used to sleep on my stomach. I laid down, and the wind, oh, same thing, and I got sucked out that room. Oh, and I went, oh, and the wind began to blow through my body under my fingernails coming out my eyes. Wind. And I'm, I'm pinned to the bed. And the curtains flew up on top of the curtain rods. And behind me, I'm sleeping. 
I heard this. You asked to see me. Turn around. And I went, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm scared. I got scared, man. I mean, not fear like you. Whoo. Man, I, whoo. And I thought, Kathy will look. <laughs> Kathy is still a very light sleeper. Boom. I, I hit it with this. Boom. I put a bruise on Kathy this big. I'm telling you, blue, black. And she goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I can remember the guy saying, she ain't gonna wake up. I said, I'm gonna beat her brains out. She gotta wake up and see who this is <laughs> in my mind. And I hit her the second time. You asked to see me turn around. <laughs> I'm just pinned to the wind blowing out of my face, out of my fingernails, just blowing everywhere. And I thought, my God, man. I said, listen, Lord, listen, listen. Forget what I said. I'm, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm hitting Kathy. Come on, woman, get up. You know. And then he asked the third time. You asked to see me. Turn around. Now, I, I know it wasn't the Father. It was Jesus. But I, I could at least see him without dying, you know. And I said, God, forgive me. I, I, maybe, you know, I want to see you. But I guess, I don't know. And, I, and all of a sudden, the wind went, whoo, And the curtains come off the hour. And I looked at Kathy. And I hear her, she goes, well, what you doing? What's your matter with you? You crazy? I said, you missed it, woman. I want to let you know. You missed it. I said, God was in this room. The curtain was on top. The rod, wind blew, and you didn't wake up. She said, what did he look like? I said, uh, I didn't turn around, Kathy. I didn't turn around. She said, yeah, chicken. <laughs> You've been praying for that all. I said, I was so mad at myself. I got up, I went to the refrigerator, made a sandwich, and sat down. I was mad at myself. You stupid, stupid, stupid idiot. Just calling myself all kinds of names. And the, the Lord spoke to my spirit. He said, I'm glad you didn't turn around. Because it's better you believe me and not see me. And Kathy wore the bruise for two weeks. She could have saw the Lord, but... She could say, you never say you can hit, you can never say you didn't hit me. I said, man, I'm telling you, Kathy, I mean, you should have seen that. I've had many encounters like that since those days. And I was probably asking in the flesh because I was a baby Christian. But today I don't have to ask. He'll come see me sometime. Just talk to me. Wake me up in the middle of the night. Woke me up three weeks ago. I went, what? He said, I'm watching you sleep. I said, you're watching me sleep? He said, yeah. He said, you know where I learned that? I said, no. He said, you. Remember when we used to walk into Jody's bedroom? She was in that little bassinet thing. She was just a baby. You'd go look at her, listen to her breathe. Watch her. He said, you're still my child. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, nothing. I'd like to talk to you. Get up. Boom, I get up, so I go straight in that study. And, well, you know, we laughing and talking and having a wonderful time. You can have that same relationship, but what I wanted was something more. That was called fellowship. Hello, Jesus. Hi, Jesse. That's my story. There's a lot more to it, but I felt... Start, start, stop there. But the Lord said, I'll visit anybody that wants me. And he told me, say it again. He said, I'm coming sooner than they think. Now, he didn't tell me when. But every day in my morning devotion, I said, Father, if it be your will, speed up the time. Like Jesus did for Mary at the wedding of Cana. When he told her, that's not my time. When he turned the water to wine, it's not my time. But he did it. I like to go to heaven with my family. But if not, I'll take the 120 years with full ability, capability, and capacity. But I prefer you come in my lifetime. But if it be your will. And about three weeks ago, I heard the father go, <laughs> I know that voice. He chuckled. And the reason why he hadn't told Jesus, because Jesus would tell us. He will. He will do it. 
I see you say, Thursday, two o'clock. <laughs> he will do it, I'm telling you. God's voice is a still, small voice to Father with great authority. Jesus' voice is a voice of love. Oh, my God, just dripping in love. That's that grace. And the Holy Spirit's voice is a voice of purity. That's why you can blaspheme the, whole, the Father, and you can get repentance for that. That's why you can blaspheme the Son, and you get repentance for that. But if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you cannot be forgiven for that. Why? That's purity at its best. That's the holiness of God and the purity of who he is. And you will not touch that. Anytime, anywhere, anyone. I'm Jesse Duplantis and I approve this testimony. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Did you enjoy it? Did it witness to you? Thank you. Please. Thank you. Did you enjoy it? Thank you. Oh, you know, you don't have to. <laughs> no, really. Serious. All right. Thank you. Please, please be seated. All you that are watching all over the world, I hope you enjoyed this. I tried not to make it mm, like a movie or get you all hyped up. But I'm telling you, God loves you as much as he loves me, and he'll come see you if you just let him. Let him do what he wants to do. Let him be what he is, a father and his family. Yeah. And mark my words, every graveyard you've seen, what a waste of money. He's going to bust them all up. We got some of the finest graveyards in the world in New Orleans. So you don't want to see that after you come back because it's going to be a garbage heap. Holes everywhere. I thought about that only when I was in Honolulu looking at the Arizona. It was bombed in World War II. The 1,100 soldiers down there. But they're coming out of there, buddy. Because he has the power of the resurrection. You don't. You have the power to raise the dead, but you don't have the power to the resurrection of the dead. What? The Lord said, say that. See, when you're resurrected, when you get raised from the dead, you die again. That's what happened to Lazarus. The son of the widow Nain had to die again. When you're resurrected from the dead, you don't die no more. You're given a new spiritual body, like I saw that they had. You can't resurrect the dead, but you can raise the dead. But you've got to have some levels of faith. You better be, know what you're doing. Because Jesus did that in the natural, in the flesh. And that same faith is in you. But resurrection comes from God Almighty himself. That's when you get the new body. But that's another sermon. That'll help you. So if you believe in the res raising by the dead, you can't resurrect them, but you can raise them if your faith is right. But resurrection comes from him. So all those people that have dissolved in World War II, World War I down in those ships, God's going to connect all that together. Whoa, they're coming out, buddy. That's that father with that finger. That's how he divided the Red Sea. With the blast of his nostrils. That's power. Give the Lord one more hand clap. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I may never do it again, and I might do it again. I don't know. I leave that up to the Lord. I, I, like I say, I, I'm very careful about exploitation of those things because they're such holy things. I was going to dismiss you, and the Lord spoke to me about receiving an offer, and I said, I don't want to do that. He said, I'm not asking what you don't want to do. <clears throat> I'm yours to command. I'm going to ask you to help me so Jesus don't have to cry no more. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to ask you to help me so Jesus won't have to cry no more. 
I've asked the Lord for every dollar given to my ministry. Give me a soul into the kingdom. I will not sleep nor rest until that comes to pass. I told a lady the other day, she gave me a million dollars. I said, I got a million souls for you. I can prove it. Boy, she busted out crying. I'm not playing games with this stuff. Brother Copeland told me, he said, Jesse, I've never seen a man walk across denominational barriers like you. I've been asked to preach at the Holy Roman Catholic Church here. Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalian, Presbyterian. I've been asked to preach for the archdiocese. I've been asked to preach in the Boston, biggest Boston synagogues. I don't try to convert people because I can't. But I can let my light shine. So what you give tonight, I'm going to use it for world evangelism. You give me a thousand dollars, I'll get a thousand people saved. You give me a million dollars, I'll get a million people saved. I know I can do it. I'm not bragging because I'm under command. And when I saw Jesus cry, I don't want to. I know I'm going to see it one more time. That's the hardest thing I, I, I could have received in heaven when I saw him say that. The worst day of my life is yet to come. When I have to tell my creation, he can't come. I'm going to try to stop that. Not all people get saved, I know that, but I'm going to do my best to make it happen. That's why you hear me witnessing all the time in restaurants and praying for people. And, you know, and I get persecuted for that. I don't care. They never seen Jesus cry. Ooh, Lord. I don't think I could tell my daughter, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I got a daughter, Jody, and a granddaughter, Mary. Oh, I, I, I'm not there, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I don't, John, I, I couldn't do that. I don't think you could do that to John, your son. Whew. This is going to be tough on Jesus, but we, we can make it a lot less if we'll just honor him. So I'm going to ask you to give if you'd like to, and if you don't want to, you don't have to. I leave that to you. I just want to let you know that I'm going to use it 100% for world evangelism. There's an offering envelope at the back of the pew if you want to use that. Or if you want to give and you somewhere in Israel or somewhere in China, you can use PayPal if you want to. Or you go to JDM website, jdm.org, or, or you can text to give. Okay, I'll say it, Lord. The reason why I work so much is because people have given me a lot of money. <laughs> you see, I'm a man of my word. I said, Lord, for every dollar, give me, give me a soul. And I will not stop. I will not stop. I will not stop. So I'm going to ask you to do your best. Please don't give me anything that belongs to your church. And let me say it again to you that are watching all over the world. If you don't want to, you don't have to. We're doing fine. But if you want to, I will do what I say. The scripture on the name of this church is Psalms 80, 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that goes out of my lips. I said, God, because you said that, I want my word to be like that. And I have declared in my own life, I'll only say what you say and do what you do. And when it comes to spiritual things, I do that. Say what you say, do what you do. I personally believe that Jesus is coming in my lifetime. He didn't tell me that. The Father didn't say that. But I'm pushing him hard. Every day. If you don't mind, think about it. Your will be done. How many of you would like for him to come tonight? Wouldn't that be something? I was flying at 41,000 feet the other night. I said, boy, a good time to come is now. I'll get there before anybody else will. I think about that constantly. When I'm up in that plane flying, 43,000, Lord, Jesus, come on. I know it sounds crazy, but when you've seen what I've seen, 
won't stop. You can't stop. So let's get the offering ready. If I have ushers, I don't even know. I don't know if they were prepared. Kathy, are they prepared to do that? Okay, I just ask you to do your best. And whatever it is, fine. And if not, fine. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for the 30, the 60, the 100 fold. Those words came from your mouth. I ask you to bless these people greatly today. Put angels on assignment. Allow them to be so blessed that they can bless so many others. Bless all ministries that are in here. If we get this job done, we'll see you coming in the cloud. I thank you for it, Lord. I believe you for it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive tonight's offering. As you're doing that, um, in just a minute, we'll have a book signing. If you can give me about 10 minutes, I gotta go change shirts, kind of wet, and things of that nature. But God has so many things for you. Hey, Aubrey, stand up. God is commissioning you to do things that you've wanted to do all your life. A great commission is coming forth. We're talking about you today. You're one of God's major singers at the throne. That'll be your job. You will be singing right next to the Father. And out of your mouth will come words, not just notes, but words that will change. God has an assignment for you at another planet. He said, she will do it. You will live in the new Jerusalem, but you will travel by the speed of thought. I've been preparing you for this all your life. Your talents are exceptional. You've had some tough times. Never be worried about your children. I will take care of them. I promise you, by my name, my hand will always be up on them. I will cause you to forget the sorrows. And in the privacy of your own life, you'll begin to sing and the songs you sing will come out of your mouth and heal your past. Because those songs will be coming from my words into your mouth and they're especially for you. So be of good cheer, saith the Lord. You're special. You mean a lot to me. You will complete your destiny and reach your destination. So rejoice. I am well pleased in you, saith the Lord. Just pray with me for a minute. Come on. Just pray with your head up and your eyes open. Come on. The Lord, your son was talking about you today. He said, tell CJ I got him. He asked the Lord today, you think my dad will be proud of me? And the Lord said, yes. He felt no pain. At the time of the accident, I took him out before he could feel the pain. I did that for you, CJ. I wouldn't let your son go through the pain that I went through. So be of good cheer. Because a meeting between you and him will be soon. I said, what does that mean, Lord? I said, give me time factor. And he said, that's my business. But you're going to hear him and see him. I don't know if that's in a dream. He didn't tell me that. I can't tell you something he didn't say. But it's going to be a great blessing to you. I said, soon, Lord, sooner than you think. <laughs> Come on, people, keep praying with me. Keep thanking God. Tim, never be afraid to prophesy. Some people don't like it. But my words are in your mouth. My words come out of your mouth. 
I will overrule all their objections. So when I come upon you to speak, speak. Because it will change lives. Not some of the time, but all the time. You're not asking God for enough. You're giving him little nibbles. He should tell him, trust me. If you trust me, I'll make the man you want to be. I'll give you the desire of your heart. But don't give, don't, just don't give me peanuts. Because you're well able to do what I want you to do. So comfort yourself with these words. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Is it okay if I just flow in the Holy Ghost a little bit? Yeah. Pray in the Holy Ghost, head up and eyes open. You have as many babies as you want. Been trying too hard. I understand the natural process. But be at peace, saith the Lord. And you too. Be at peace. And just love each other. This is our husband. And let God be God. Should I say that, Lord? And I'll have to get somebody while you're having a baby. Do your job so you can come back a little later. <laughs> Just be at peace. Your heart desire. I heard it, saith the Lord. Come on, people. Keep praying with me. Hey, sweetheart. How you doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a little. Oh, Lord, take a portion of my spirit. Place it in her. Make her not healed, but whole. I decree and declare that in the name of Jesus. I call it done, Lord. Let her see you coming in a cloud with full ability, capability, and capacity. I thank you for it, Lord. And I call it done in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. What you've been praying is right. Been some delays. Satan's mad. Trying to stop everything. He can't. You're too strong. Don't let time defeat you. The answer's already been sent. And it'll soon be here. Ooh. I said, what is it, Lord? It's none of your business, Jesse, that's between me and her. But get ready. It's already been sent. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Come on, keep praying with me. Where's the little boy that likes peanut butter? He may not be here, but his parents loves peanut butter. You gotta almost have to close it up. Where? Where? That's your child. That's crazy, Lord. He should tell her, I'm going to make him extra crunchy. <laughs> Which means I'm going to give him a flavor. Yes. And when people walk by him, they'll want the taste of me. I'm going to work with children because adults are not doing what I'm asking them to do. So I will go all the way down to the babies, to the children, and I'll put the oracle of God in their mouth and they will speak it and people will taste it and eat it, saith the Lord. Ooh, that's an unusual word. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Come on. Pretty girl. She works for me. I call her pretty girl because I can't remember their names. 
Be still and know that I am God. You can shake it, but don't. Just be still. And I'm going to make everything right. And you'll be happier than you've ever been. You're not a mistake. You were not a mistake. People didn't know how wonderful you really are. But I do. And all that stuff that happened back there with your parents and stuff. You were not the mistake. Thank you. He said, tell her, I find no fault in you. Oh, my God, that's good. Come on, people, just thank the Lord for that. Come on, thank the Lord for that. Come on. Pray with me in the Holy Ghost. Ain't nobody can stop you, Glenn. Because you'd like to do good things. You will heal up and get stronger than you've ever been. People will say, what's your success? How do you do that at your age? You'll tell them, Jesus does it. I just follow his orders. So be a good cheer. Satan tried his best, but he didn't make it. You can live as long as you want. That's all within your mouth and not mine. Because death and life's in the power of that tongue. People, come on, keep praying with me. Ah, bless. Lydia, let me have your hand. Oh, God, she's going to freak over this. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to be alone. What does that mean? He said, tell her. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Come on, somebody shout, somebody. Thank you, Lord. Oh, glory to God. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Speak more, Kathy. Because you got pearls inside of you. You may have them on your neck, but they're way bigger inside you. Speak more. Let that come out of your mouth. It's not how you say it. It's what you say. You can't be him, and you should not be. I've called him, but I put some pearls in your mouth. And I'll make your words like a string of pearls that people and I'll give you a revelation you never thought you could have. Yeah, and he said, tell her, people will begin to come and say, you know what you said the other day? Went off of me like a shotgun and changed everything in my life. Speak more. Let it come forth. Because not only do women need to hear what you say, but men too. Yeah, yeah. And I will give you a special anointing. I want to say this right. For those that have been adopted, I will make you a mother to people you never thought you would be. And you'll take the guilt from them. And why didn't they want me? Why didn't they keep me? I'm going to use you in that area. Peter will show come and it'll be a great ministry. And it'll wipe away tears and sorrow and bad memories, saith the Lord. Ooh, glory. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Oh, let's just thank the Lord. Come on, just thank him for it. I can hear my spirit. Send him over here. He said, tell him I'm over there. I'm over there. Kalelo shukunre sikinde. 
I don't know when this is going to happen, but you see, when I put my hand on your shoulder like that, there's a time coming where God will place his hand on your shoulder. It will be physical, brother. You will know it's him. And from that touch will come direction of what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and how to do it. Oh. And I'm going to trap some people that they thought could not be trapped. And I'm going to use your words to do it. Get ready. You are my person to do these things. So be a good cheer. You've been commissioned. You've been called. And you soon will see your assignment. Oh, I like that. Somebody shout over that. Isn't that good? Come on. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord of God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Woo. Yes, Lord. You should tell everybody when they go home tonight or wherever they're going to sleep, they can ask me anything. I'm in a giving mood. I'm in a giving mood. I want to do a lot of things if people will allow me to. I'll tell you what I want. I want double the anointing. I want double the outreaches. I want double the finance just so I can go do what he asked me to do. I know I can speed up the time if the body of Christ will do it. Great sums of money are coming to the church. Some will be so excited, but they'll have the wrong purpose of it. But I will straighten them out, saith the Lord. I want my people that I created to know me. And I can supply anything anybody could need, desire, or want if they'll use it for me. If they'll honor me for it. But before you do something, pray, ask me. Because there's many adversaries out there that look like they're doing something, but they're not. I want your seed to go into fertile soil. I will always take care of you because you are a giver. But I want to see the harvest and you want to see the harvest of those things. Tell them what I told you just, I said, okay, Lord, in the midst of all this chaos, in the days of Noah, Jesus said, so will the Son of Man come? As it was in the days of Noah, the church can flourish greatly in the midst of all the sin. Satan couldn't kill the righteousness. There was eight righteous put on a, on a boat, started this thing over. That was in Noah's days. Look for the church to flourish. Because it will, those that obey, because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Ah, one more thing. Some from the government will come to try to shut you down, but you'll get them saved in the process, and they'll just go back and say, forget what I said. Forget what I said. Exact words. We touched something holy and we should not have done that. What must be done must be done quickly because he's coming sooner than you think. Stand to your feet and give Jesus a standing ovation. Come on, somebody. Shout, somebody. It's been a high honor. And I thank all of you for coming out on your Friday night. I prayed. I said, God, we've had enough water for Noah to come down the street in a boat. Dry it out by Friday night, will you? And he did. It's been a pleasure and an honor. To all my spiritual sons and daughters, I can't thank you enough for thinking of us the way you do. To all you wonderful people that took time out, thank you for coming. All you that were watching, wherever you were watching, we'll find that all out later on. I need one prayer request. It's not a tragic thing. One of my finest employees went home to be with the Lord today. He was working in our finance department. His name was Dale. His wife is Denise Dufresne. 
Dale had a heart attack. And they rushed him to the hospital and he, and he passed. Of all times when I'm going to talk about heaven. I got the information, I guess, about 5 o'clock this afternoon, maybe 5.15. And I talked to Denise, that's his wife, who works for me too. And we prayed the peace of God that passed all understanding. And I said, Denise, he's seeing what I'm talking about tonight. Comfort yourself with these words. So be praying for the Dufresne family, also for Jesse Flanders Ministries. He was well-loved, well-liked worked in our finance department, probably handled some of your partner's gifts. Brilliant man, hardworking man, wonderful man. I talked to him Thursday. It was like nothing happened. But he's in the very presence of God Almighty. So pray for the, his wife called Denise and his wonderful sister, Mamie. She said, that's my little brother. I said, yeah, I know. But Jesus bore your grief and took your sorrow. You should miss him, but you should never grieve. Don't let Satan use that when he's in heaven trying to beat you about something. Okay? So thank you. Be praying for us because they're, they're going to be making those arrangements and things of that nature. And God will richly bless you. Uh, I'm going to go back here and change my shirt. Come on up here, Chrissy. I believe you got the... Uh, She's going to give you some announcement real quick about the book signing if you so desire. And if not, that's fine. Do whatever you want to. Come, Chrissy. That's all right. And uh, uh, God has been so good and gracious. Uh, tell people about these things. And if you have that wonderful experience, don't do what I did and hold it. We're in the last days. Tell it. Don't exploit it, but tell it. And it'll bless somebody and honor somebody. Okay? Chris is going to tell you a few things, and I'll be back there in a the practice. Give me about 10 minutes so I can take this uh, shirt off and everything, put on a dry shirt, okay? Chris, it's yours. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, Appreciate that. Give Brother Jesse another round of applause. What an amazing night. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be leaving going, glory to God. Glory. And start that chain reaction. What a glorious Jesus. night in God's presence. I just want to say thank you to our global audience watching all over the world. We have a special announcement from Facebook, YouTube. We had over 41 states watching and 24 countries all over the world hearing this amazing message. Give our global audience a round of applause. This is amazing. And if you're tuning in right now, thank you so much. What we want you to do is like and share this video so we can get the message out that Jesus is coming back. We're so excited. Also, I want to make sure that you mark your calendars for Visionary Conference 2021. Who's going to come back? We're excited. It's July 15th and 16th right here at JDM International Headquarters in Destrehan, Louisiana. It's going to be powerful. Those who are watching online, please visit JDM.org for more information. Thank you so much to our global audience. It has been a beautiful night. And thank you so much for helping us reach people and change lives one soul at a time. Hallelujah. All right, awesome. A vision always starts with a dream. Do you see yours? Break free from the boundaries of natural thinking and ignite your vision. Your vision isn't where you are. It's where you're going. Faith and divine direction can bring it to completion. Your vision is calling you. Make your vision a living reality. Jesse Duplantis' 2021 Visionary Conference, July 15th and 16th. Did you know that doubt is a habit? Yes, it is. You aren't born a doubter. You learn to doubt over time. In my book, I Never Learned to Doubt, you will learn something. And what is that? To go back in time and regain what was lost so that you can enjoy more peace, more joy, more favor, and more blessing. The wonder of faith is a pure thing. It's a childlike thing. And faith is the only thing that God responds to. When you never learn to doubt, life is so much better. I never learned to doubt. It's my new book. Get it today. Due to the faithful financial support of our partners, we are reaching people, changing lives, one soul at a time on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to donate to this ministry, many people do. Mm -hmm. There are many easy ways to give, including JDM.org, text to give, PayPal, or you can send it in by mail. Thank you for being a part of our vision. 
Together we are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. Kathy, we could not do this without these people yes, doing that. Yes, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know you're going to be blessed. And let me tell you something. We promise you right now, 100% of what you send will go into world evangelism to reach people, to change, change lives. lives, one soul at a time. This is Jesse and Kathy saying thank you for being a part of this ministry. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.